here is some of the myocarditis information that a large swath of our audience basically instinctively or intuitively was focused on. Now, for now, using the word focus, let's focus on this 101. That 101 is 101 individuals per million after the second vaccine, uh, particularly the mRNA 1273 vaccine. What is that compared to with regular SARS-CoV-2 infection for that same age group of males less than 40 years of age? Well, that 101 is about 14 times greater than I guess what you consider seven that would normally have myocarditis in reference to testing positive to SARS-CoV-2. Now, each vaccine, a lot were potentially less, but all of them end up being more than the general background rate of regular SARS-CoV-2 infection after the second shot. And this primarily affects males. 101 to 7 in the age group of 40 or less of males. Now that's going to bring a lot of questions in reference to risk assessment. And after the third shot, it's still about double, uh, but it's 13 uh, compared to 7. So again, and that would be after a booster or third shot. We're now talking four, four shots. And we're going to get this study out of the way real fast, but I will have the link. And so it will be there for you. All right, so let's close this one out. Not a lot of positive stuff this week in regards to things that help alleviate uh, some of the negative outcomes in, uh, in reference to uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2. So we're really going to be focusing primarily on vaccine effectiveness and Australia. Now, Australia, we're going to look at Omicron. All right, you see Australia right there, this Delta at 19.84, and there's Omicron 80.6. So let's look a little historically at Omicron here and Omicron here. And the reason I'm picking on Australia is because, obviously, the, um, the over-the-top uh, lockdown and isolation uh, mitigation strategy from Australia based really more upon superstition and paranoia. I know correlation and causal and everything else like that, but in the end, this is all about correlation because everyone's learning. But here we go, and you'll see what I mean in a second. So here we have Australia. And again, this is about the maniacal Australian leadership which really I have a thing against. I'm not I'm not, not in favor of the policy whatsoever, not the way they're treating the population. And so there we are. December 13th, right there. And that's across 2021. We're at Omicron 11.17. And all those lockdowns and all that isolation and everything else along those lines resulted in less than about almost, I'd say almost two weeks later, 80.16 in the Omicron appearing in those testing positive. We'll come back to this in a second too. But however, though, how does that compare, let's say, to India? Uh, where it's right here is, at, for example, if you look right there, India is at 87.5%. And that equal growth. So how does India, which is much lower vaccination rate than Australia, nowhere near as stringent in pandemic lockdown mitigation factors and so on and so forth. How would India compare to Australia? Let us look. Using our favorite Our World and Data, which is one of our information sources, again, I really, really recommend them highly. Well, look what we have here. There we have it, you see? If you look at India, right there. Yes. That is real. There is Australia. So all the Munchausen uh, Machiavellian paranoid, um, almost to a point where really it is, you, you got to admit it, it's just on the tad bit maniacal side, that is the result. So yeah, there definitely needs to be a change of leadership. And so, just to give you an idea, and we'll come back to that in a second, too. Information that we will be covering tonight, just as a heads up. Ba, ba, ba. All right, we're going to be going to why the vaccines do not 
work as intended. Really good study on that. We're going to come back to that a little bit. Uh, South Africa uh, is obviously coming through this with flying colors. Uh, I don't want to say flying colors in a way like that because it is an illness. But compared to the rest of the globe, we'll look into basically why South Africa is dropping. Um, basically, they're no longer doing trade contact tracing and quarantine. They're running the asymptomatic. Uh, or because they said containment of the virus is no longer viable. And you'll see why they came to that conclusion in a little bit. Again, and then as well, too, uh, we're looking at COVID-19 vaccination breakthroughs in cancer patients. Uh, real interesting information in regard to comparing fully vaccinated cancer patients against unvaccinated cancer patients. We'll come back to that. Um, Omicron, real interesting as far as how far away it is uh, from becoming totally uh, resistance or avoiding everything and just give you an idea and then also to really good background information in regard to how much of your particular state if you're in the united states has either some sort of uh, protection against severe infection either through actual encountering sars in the wild or if they were fully vaccinated and again there's questions in reference to the length of time that vaccine will hold compared to natural immunity and it does appear at this point in time, natural immunity is really, really winning. So let us begin. And I was well as well too. If you if you're vaccinated and you get infected, then you're super immune, which obviously is a new sales pitch to if the vaccine doesn't work, it actually works better when it doesn't work. That's kind of the same logic. I'm still waiting for them to release those UFO files. And the JFK files from last year that uses the wonderful distraction as well. Omicron outbreak at private gathering. You can see, for example, the number of, let's just get this one out of the way real fast so I can close it. All right. These all end up being symptomatic cases, which is really intriguing because normally you don't have 100% symptomatic, but these are triple vaccinated individuals and 21 of the 33 attending. So we're talking a total group. Remember, we're having less and less unvaccinated individuals. So we have less and less comparison groups. But 21 of the 33 came down with symptomatic COVID, albeit they weren't hospitalized. But it was symptomatic. 100% symptomatic rate uh, in reference to a triple vaccinated. Now, there could be a lot of confounding involved in that regardless, but still just the same. Let's get it out of the way. So that just gives you an idea of the extent of protection. And we'll go into why that protection may be failing. And then our information sources as well, because I have it out of order, is our Endure Vigilance, Our World and Data, which we just looked at. And then VAERS, just to give you a the disclaimer right off the bat, um, most report to VAERS before we look at it. Can that be determined if vaccine can cause a contributive illness? Uh, coincidental, unverifiable, da, da, da. We've gone through that before, but just in case, I mean, Joe, always take it with a grain of salt and with his validation, Provided that VAERS has enough people to actually go through, what is it, 730,000 individual reports. And if you compare the duplicate reports on top of that, somewhere over a million. We'll get to that exact number in a second. GISA, in reference to basically monitoring the variants. And thank goodness they're around, otherwise we'd be working in the dark. So let us begin with our first research article as we begin. All right. Focus on these two words, LLPCs, MBCs. MBC is memory B cell, LLPC, long-lived plasma cell. What you will learn is why the vaccines do not seem to work very well is because this right there doesn't happen. This, yes. This, no. But regardless of that, remember LLPC. And I'll explain exactly why in a second. I'm going to try to detecticalize, detecticalize this. We'll reverse engineer it just a little bit into more common terms. But let us begin. And the research article is as follows. Ba -ba -bam. RNA COVID-19 vaccines, long-lived plasma cells, a complicated relationship. And it's real intriguing. They rec as far as why the vaccines, these particular COVID vaccines, uh are missing one incredibly vital element, and that's long-term immunity. So let's read some of the highlights. There is no evidence 
that these vaccines induce the production of long-lived plasma cells in a SARS-CoV-2 virus-naive population. No evidence, all right? So they're being honest. And they went through some studies too as reference to that, the long-lived plasma cells. Now, let's see if I can go down real fast and basically why these long-lived plasma cells are important. And I'm going to skip ahead just real briefly. Conceptually, T cells do not recognize the virus, but only the virus infected cells. So here you are, your T cells. So the virus comes in until that virus infects the cells, conceptually, then the T cell doesn't recognize it. Once that unwelcome guest sits on that couch, ba -boom, or cells that have been internalized viral antigens produced after infection. So for example, the virus keeps on reproducing. So infection is not prevented by T cells, only long live plasma cells have this ability. Let us go back to the top. Do, 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 do. And we go. No evidence. These vaccines produce long live plasma cells. And with that in mind, let us proceed the rest of the way. Ba -ba. The nucleoside-modified mRNA in the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine is formulated in lipid particles, which enable delivery of the nucleotide-modified mRNA into host cells to allow expression of the SARS-CoV-2 antigen. The vaccine eluc elucids, elucidates, elicits an immune, you, you kind of use the word if you want to, an immune response to the S antigen, which protects against COVID-19. It is evident from these data that the phrase delivery of the RNA into host cells is not the mechanism of action of the vaccine. All right. Wow. It is evident from these data that the phrase delivery of the RNA into host cells is not the mechanism of action of the vaccine. Now we begin to get really serious. Again, I'll have the links for you and they'll be highlighted so you can go on on your own. But to proceed, overall, the absence of these long lived plasma cells is documented by the absence of spike specific antibodies four to six months after the second dose of the vaccine. Although some studies, uh, some studies low antibody teeter, teeters persist beyond six months. After infection, the memory B cells, remember that word, MBCs and TCD8 lymphocytes must intervene to block the expression of the infection. It has been shown that vaccination with the mRNA vaccine results in the production of TCD8 cells, but these cells were capable of expressing a lower concentration of CD38 molecules than natural infection. So to give a synopsis, natural infection does something better than basically the mRNA vaccine. All right, to proceed forward. Conceptually, T cells do not recognize the virus. Yes, we are reiterating, but only the virus infected TCD8 cells right here, or cells that have internalized viral antigens produced after infection. So infection is not prevented by T cells only Long live plasma cells have this ability. Proceed forward. Some more of the highlights. And again, this is in intriguing information in reference to anybody that wants to get into the technical aspect of it. It is really, really vital as to why this particular subset of inoculations needs to be improved. Otherwise, what? Why? Why? What are you doing? All right, immune memory. Vaccine effectiveness depends on immunological memory, short-lived plasma cells. No, we're not talking long-lived. During responses in extrafollicular B cell foci, where the long-lived plasma cells are generated in T-dependent GC responses to protein antigens, MBC, the memory cells, are formed early in the response, whereas the long-lived plasma cells are a later product. Around 10% of MBCs recognize the variant antigen better than the wild type protein, thus allowing for breath protection compared to the long-lived plasma cells. 
The plasma blasts generated in the GC enter the circulation and home to the BM where they are differentiated to LLPCs about three weeks after immunization. The BM becomes a major site for antibody production, usually memory temporal T cells. Uh, TCD4 memory cells emerge in parallel with the MBCs. All right, so you get the idea. It's a little technical, but we'll move forward. Long live plasma cells. Numeral immunity that lasts over time is dependent on the LLPCs, the long lived plasma cells that produce the immunoglobulin G antibodies continuously and are independently a subset specific antigen, antigenic stimulus, which instead is essential for activating the MBCs. So what ends up happening is, in short, in order for this to keep on happening, you know you need to keep on inoculating as opposed to if you had the LLPCs produced, you'd be activating that. All right, proceed forward. Do, 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 do. To be effective, a vaccine must elicit the production of efficient LL long-lived plasma cells. Quoting, we did a search on PubMed with the keywords long-lived plasma cells, any of you could do the same thing, after COVID-19 vaccines and retrieved three papers, just three, being that important, just three. These papers that were analyzed in depth, two of these papers refer to the production of B memory after infection with SARS-CoV-2 and one that developed SARS-CoV-2 vaccine uh, the latest study demonstrated the GC generated SARS vaccine, but also a cross reactive MBCs are recruited as well. And newly engaged clones that target unique epitopes, da 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 da, da which are programmed to become plasma, plasma cells, but not LLPC. All right, to proceed forward. What happened was one of the studies as well was done in mice, which are pretty much resistant to the SARS CoV 2, anyways, which remember last week, they were uh, postulating that basically Omicron was human to mouse and the mouse back to human. So you get an idea. All right, proceed forward. And then the conclusion. I apologize for the technical aspect of this, but it's really super important. In other words, the response to vaccination is considered by the presence of cross-reactive memory B cells and cross-reactive T cells that, however, have the drawback of the original antigenic sin. I like that. Furthermore, the eventual production of a GC sees cross-reactive T cells collaborate with naive B cells whose contact with the antigen could be hindered by the presence of MBC memory B cells that could also interfere in the production of long-lived plasma cells. In fact, the waning of humoral immunity, which occurs within six months of the second vaccine dose, is attributable to, attributable to, to the absence of LLPCs. There is only one study, here we go, showing that mice showing that LLPCs are produced after injection of a SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccine. Just one. All right. Unfortunately, these mice are not permissive to SARS-CoV-2 infection, which we just talked about a second ago. Probably, these vaccines evoke memory B cells, but do not evoke long-lived plasma cells. And for this reason, vaccination is not able to prevent a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Due to the limited life expectancy of the memory B cells, periodic antigenic stimulation is required to regenerate this type of memory. And you ready for this? So in order for this to work, in order for the inoculation strategy to work, here we go. I should have highlighted this. Please forgive me on that. Finally, we believe that it is necessary to administer a dose of a vaccine every four months to high-risk individuals or to frail subjects, possibly increasing the amount of antigen in the booster doses. There you have it. So basically, it's the absence of these LLPCs, for whatever reason, are going to keep individuals every four months with this type of inoculation strategy in order to maintain what is needed, since these aren't being produced, to produce these in order to fight off SARS-CoV-2 infection. Or, you know what? You just develop a better vaccine, which would be kind of cool too. And just to reiterate, towards the bottom here, you know, is all your acronyms as far as what your abbreviations are, memory B cells, long-lived plasma cells, 
and the link will be there for you as well. Now, to South Africa. Here we go. Ba -ba -ba. South African population immunity and severe COVID-19 with Omicron variant. Highlights. Here we go. Ba -ba -do 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 -do. They just basically just said through. They they said you know what this is done, and they've they've just basically said hey uh, we have to move on and long and how would you say learn to live with this. All right, but here we go. Although there is a lag in excess death reporting, the current rate of one per hundred thousand mortality death is lower than the twenty five per hundred thousand they used to have. So they're at one per 100,000 right now. One per 100,000, South Africa, as opposed to 25. And they just said, you know what? They're there, right, right there. Boom. It's like, how can, it's like, wow. Can you imagine if the U.S. was at a one per 100,000 or something like that? Or any of the European countries with their maniacal lockdowns and quarantines and everything else like that? Uh, right there. And there's their daily cases. And there is basically the outcome. Now, what they're talking about here is uncoupling. The uncoupling of infections being correlated with hospitalizations or mortality. And what they've said is basically they, this has now become uncoupled. And so here we go. Only 21.1% 20 have received at least two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine as part of the National Vaccine Rollout Program. But however, though, Seropositivity across the provinces, including up to 85.8% in some sub-districts. Sub and we're not that far off here in the United States. Prior to the onset of the current Omicron dominant wave, this high rate of seropositivity has been induced by prior infection, as evidenced by 68.4% of seropositivity rate in COVID-19 unvaccinated individuals. In this context, we have observed a dramatic uncoupling. That's the word and death rates from infection compared with previous waves. We've seen a high COVID-19 case rate due to the Omicron dot and high seropositivity rate for humoral immune response consistent with Omicron variant being antibody evasive. And we go down to the bottom here. Although we did not evaluate some immediate immunity, other studies have reported that natural infection induces a diverse polyapitopic cell-mediated immune response targeted against the spike protein, nucleocapsid protein, and membrane protein. Consequently, sub I'm speaking kind of fast. Please forgive me. Submediated immunity is likely to be more durable than anybody. Immediate immunity, immunity, forgive me, in the context of small mutations, particularly those mainly affecting the spike protein. So you get the idea. Uh, there, as you can see, that robust memory T cell response because of the natural infection. So we move to see forward. Whereas majority of individuals have developed immunity from, to reiterate, natural infection. So it, it so as proceed and conclude. 70% effectiveness seen against severe disease in South Africa might as well be due to the hybrid cell immunity induced by vaccination and, and natural infection. So they're going, no, 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 no. You can't use, you, you cannot use the vaccine as saying it's 70% effective if you're dealing with individuals which already had the infection. Remember, this is the only vaccine campaign I've ever seen advertised where they actually advertise the vaccine as working better when it doesn't work. So meaning you get fully vaccinated, you get an infection, which you shouldn't have had if you were vaccinated, and now you even have a better immune system than you were if you're just fully vaccinated. Yeah. All right, next article up to bat. Here we go. Da, da, da. All right, this is interesting. I'm going to read you this one headline first. This is looking at COVID-19 vaccination breakthrough infections in patients with cancer. Remember, I'm all about observation. I'm all about correlation. And this is, I've, I've never imagined such an, uh, an environment where observational data is discounted at such an incredibly high rate because it doesn't conform to a bias. And this is among really, really smart individuals, brilliant individuals, which I highly respect. So let's look at this correlation, uh, which seemed to avoid this one particular statement. Patients who were categorized as fully vaccinated at the time of COVID-19 when two doses of vaccination had been administered. All right. And so here's our results. Well, let's go here, here first. I'll read you, read you this part so you can get an idea of, of some of the confounding. Among the 54 fully vaccinated patients who developed COVID-19, 65% were hospitalized, 19% were admitted to ICU, and 13% died. Comparable rates to say were observed in the unvaccinated group. Well, 
that's not the reason why people are getting vaccinated. People are getting vaccinated so you don't have comparable rates. That's the whole point. So let's see what those comparable rates were. Here we go. Ready? Ba -ba -bum. Can I make this bigger? Let's see if I can make this bigger. Ah, it won't get bigger. Now I'll do it this way. Because I just want you to be able to see it. All right, here we are. Fully vaccinated. Right here. See that right here? Fully vaccinated. Unvaccinated. Let's just compare one to one. So here's our fully vaccinated group. Here's our unvaccinated group. 30-day mortality. 13%. 30-day mortality. 10%. Admitted to intensive care. Again, still fully vaccinated. 19%. Admitted to intensive care. Unvaccinated. 13%. Hospitalized. 65%. Hospitalized of the unvaccinated, 50%. Yeah. You see what I mean? There, where is, you, you don't even come close in observational data, and your study groups are actually larger in the other group. So as we look at this, right there, as you can see, if you want to do a close comparison, knowing where the, the tabs are at the top, what the heck? And you're not getting vaccinated just for fun. You're getting vaccinated to get better results than this. Where the non-vaccinated group, for whatever reason, that could be confounding or whatever it is as we do the data, actually did quite better than the fully vaccinated group. That's not supposed to happen, but it does. And the way it's worded is comparable. Now nah, you'd want your money back. All right, to proceed forward. New study adds more evidence of Omicron immunization. Keep on messing with uh, different ways for um, you know, vaccine escape, leaky vaccines, whatever it is, viral pathogen replacement, antigenic drift. You know, the vaccine is going to keep on modifying itself to survive. And thank goodness Omicron is so much of a less of a threat than the other ones. Um, there's the reason why. Large drops in Omicron neutralization by antibody from vaccines. Most monoclonal antibodies are unable to neutralize Omicron. And it says right off the bat here, it is not too far-fetched to think that SARS-CoV-2 is now only a mutation or two away from being completely resistant to current antibodies. Either monoclonal antibodies used by therapies or the antibodies generated by vaccination or infection with previous variants. Now, this is where this study becomes important with natural infection. And this is what they said too as far as either hybrid or natural infection, as far as seroprevalence, because natural infection seems to be fairly effective against Omicron, where it's appearing that, you know, inoculation, there's some questions to proceed forward. Population immunity SARS-CoV-2. I'm gonna have this link because this is just important for you personally, for information wise. So we scroll down, scroll down, scroll down gives a really good job in the prevalence, and th this is all about how the data is collected, but the main meat of the study that's gonna be most important to you as an individual is gonna be as follows. Here we are, you see? Check this out. You see California? 68% at least received a vaccine, has a vaccination ratio of 1.24 to the uh, unvaccinated, and so that's basically the general ratio, so 1.24, four pe vaccinated people per one vaccinated individuals. Does that make any sense? And 79% of the population is protected against severe disease. Let's look at Florida. 68.2% has a one-to-one. -one. Well, that's almost got that circled. So one vaccinated person to one unvaccinated person. 83.8% of the individuals are basically are protected against severe disease because they have been exposed at one point or another. And you get some weird uh, wonky numbers. For example, Hawaii, high vaccination rate, high level of vaccinated to unvaccinated, but yet their protection against severe disease compared to, let's say, Florida is lower, primarily because of seroprevalence. And now with new variants coming out and you have vaccines, which can only hold immunity potentially to four to six months, and well, that's not bad six. 
And then if you get a booster, how long is that going to last? They haven't covered that information as yet, but it seems natural infection is out there for the win. Not saying get infected or whatever it comes down to be, but those that have been exposed, either asymptomatic or whatever, um, yeah, uh, it looks like large swaths of the population have been exposed, um, regardless, vaccinated or unvaccinated, and to proceed forward. I'll have the link for you as well. Uh, we covered this one already, 21 out of 33, but it was symptomatic. That's the one that got me the most. And now let's go here. And just because the, the terrifying idea of, remember how they all said we're going to kill the virus and things like that, number one, you know, a lot of people hear the word kill virus and they automatically on a scientific scale go, you can't kill a virus. But, and the big argument against there not being an animal reservoir of basically SARS-CoV-2, because if there was, then all lockdowns and everything else and masks and things like that uh, were just basically actions in futility. And here we go. Deer. Now, interesting part about this, I love how sometimes on a, on a quantum scale, certain things happen at the exact same time. Well, deer in six Ohio locations. Scientists are unsure if wild deer can next be this next or be a SARS-CoV-2 virus reservoir. All right. And not going to go through the whole study because then shortly after that, what day was this? This was 23rd? Yeah, 23rd. After that, boom, 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 same day. So here we go. And what is it? Now in Texas. Texas deer. Ohio deer. Texas deer. And so whatever it is, for whatever reason, and what to say as well too, research suggests deer could be a possible source of human infection. There's your potential animal reservoir, if not as well as being mice on its own scale. All right, we actually got some time. Let's get into the data analytics. Here we go. Are you ready? Ba, ba, ba. Let's start off with number one. Let's go to do, 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 do. let's go to the web scraping site so we can see exactly this, the size of our VARES database as we're ending up the year. Uh, zip file size, December 25th. I think that's probably going to be it for this year, and I'll zip file this whole thing up so we can save it so it can continue to compare. 168 megabytes compared to 122 megabytes. Visually, there is our vaccine adverse event reporting uh, data this year only compared to all the other years prior, which yields us a file size comparison as, let's do it this way, each year. There we are. There is 2021 compared to 2020 and all the way down the line. So yes, if we compare all the data together, file size comparison, all the reports for basically this year compared to the three decades prior is 45.71 megabytes greater or basically 37% larger than the prior three decades. And again, for those not familiar, the data source for that is as follows. You look at theirs. Look at right there, you see? And then you look at the prior years. Incredible. In incredible. That, and you wonder, if they, if they barely had the, pop, the personnel to research the files before, now, whoa. All right, here we go. So after that, let's go down to mutations. And then we'll go into the other databases, the European Neurovigilance Database, so on and so forth. Let's give it a second here. All right. Ba -ba -ba. All right. So let's go up to the top so I don't lose any information here. And let's, there's our correlation. I don't know what happened here, but data wise, we'll find out. Uh, between, this is just correlation, there'd be tons of confounding people fully vaccinated, the total cases per million. All right. Now, this is the important part. Remember, this is the vaccine part. Zero to 10 per 100 being vaccinated uh, compared to 81 to 100 being vaccinated. 
The data is getting kind of wonky now because some people are receiving three or four vaccines before it used to be considered two vaccines to be fully vaccinated. If the bar keeps on changing on what fully vaccinated it is, then this is going to mess with the entire graph. Mortality per million, working along those lines. Those are your countries which basically have the 81 to 100 fully vaccinated. And what I'm looking for is a correlation of some sort. And you tell me if you see one. Now, reproduction rate, that's interesting. But then when you look at the reproduction rate and you look at new cases smooth per million, you see? And even then, if you take out the 0 to 10, as you say you combine as an outlier, why is the reproduction rate the second highest, I should say, if you want to be dramatic, is in those which are the most vaccinated per 100? Why? And then this one, obviously, I have to readjust the x-axis because we're at... 498.73 cases per million of 71 to 80 people per 100 being vaccinated compared to look at these countries, Algeria, Egypt, Iraq, Libya, uh, Bangladesh, Bulgaria, Guatemala. You see all the way down the line and they're doing better. So where is, can you keep, what would be the number correl correlating that you would have? And obviously 0.7 would mean there's, there's, this possible causal relationship to some extent, but I can't, I, not that I don't believe in vaccines. Obviously some vaccines are really, really good. And, but they're all there is medicine. But if I was look at this from, uh, if I was, you know, expected to buy a vaccine for my country and I'm looking at this data, I'm going, huh? Mm, yeah. All right, let's continue to move forward. All right, there's Denmark. Look at this. This is fully vaccinated per 100, right? And you see the, the chart right here. And so, and look at the cases per million. Spain, uh, Portugal, United Kingdom. I mean, where is the correlation? And so we go, I'm looking at boosters now too. And so we proceed forward. Uh, this little corner right here, people fully vaccinated per 100, new cases smooth per million. If, for example, you can see Denmark there. And you can see uh, Czechia. Uh, this is how you can pick a lot of information out. It's a really cool way of doing it. So if you look at this, and let's say we just want to look at Denmark. And there we are. Look what happened. Fully vaccinated. Yeah, interesting. And that's a good idea. Here's the countries as a whole. They're going down, 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 down. All right, this is people fully vaccinated per 100. And if you look at this, let's look at new death smooths per million. Um, wow. It's like China is way up there. And they are considered one of the most vaccinated. Well, what the heck? That is China, right? Yeah, China. All right. But see, that's how we discover things data analyst, data looking wise. Uh, total boosters per country now. Well, that's China, and they have the most deaths per million. Uh, new deaths per million? No. See, oh, I apologize about that. China doesn't report its information. So, da-da-da. So, it's the total boosters are always popping up. So, please forgive me on that. And so, there it is. Look at the new cases per million. It's really weird. Why would they... That, that's what they, they report the boosters, but they don't report the cases or the mortality. Interesting. Uh, reproduction rate, does that pop up? They do report that, but just get an idea. And then you can see there's your, uh, look at this, United Arab Emirates in Kenya. Now look at the reproduction rates between these two. Now check this out. Now this, this is actually cool. If we look at this, check this out. Fully vaccinated per 100. Kenya, United Arab Emirates, reproduction rate, Kenya, a little bit higher than the United Arab Emirates. So again, sell me a vaccine, sell me an inoculation. And here we go, down the line. Uh, Singapore, bounce back, I'm going to scroll through that. Uh, down the line, the positivity rate, and that's probably going to be Omicron because that popped up in their, their country as well. Uh, Belgium positivity rate that went up a little bit too. 
and that's basically just going down looks like all right scroll down and then we have our variance you can see for example delta is still out there quite heavily but I'm going to focus only on Omicron since that's really the uh, variant of the day. And it seems like viral pathogen replacement is taking place since they don't seem to be related with Delta. Uh, but you can see as far as the growth between the countries. And again, this all started back, I believe, on Omicron first made its debut on at least in Nigeria. Don't believe it was here at all. If they go back, no. Yeah, as far as being listed as Omicron. But there you are. And then it just kind of uh, basically just took off as we saw. One day it's Nigeria. Next day it's in South Africa. Next day it starts popping up all over the place. And then now it's the pathogen of the day. All right. To get back out of that, let's go down to Vera's. It's right off the bat. To do. -do. Vaccine Averse Event Reporting System, for those not familiar. And these reports submitted to Veros. Right, let's give it a second here. because This is a bigger database. So there we go. All right, we have 731,428 individual reports. Now keep in mind, 310,266 are duplicates. So we have a total of 1,041,694 reports being reported to Veros but only out of 731,428 individuals. All right, so we proceed down the line. And see the interesting information comes up. There's our total reports. Next, I think is mortality. Uh, 9,460 non-duplicated reports reported to VAERS. Remember, we're not looking at the total mortality beyond the 1% that normally gets reported, but however, though, we, we'll, we, we want it to do with hard figures. All right, and then scroll down the line. There is our, basically our vaccine reaction reports to 2021 compared to 2020. And then I'm just going to scroll down. And due to expediency on time, there's a motion fatigue reports being submitted, so on and so forth. The myocarditis I want to get down to, the average age really is about still about 26 on the reports of myocarditis. And then all the way down the line. Hang on one second, we'll be right back. Yeah, and let's finish off this report right here as far as what we have here. Let's see. Yeah, scroll down there. Let's go to the next next segment, see if there's any more additional information there that we can actually uh, scrape through. Give it a second. All right. Now, this I've redone on the, one of the other things. So I'm going to probably close out this screen here. I don't think there's any additional data that we need. Well, here we are. Uh, this is basically this COVID deaths being reported to individuals under the age of um, basically 17 on the web. Oh, that's conflicting with the y-axis there. So about a ratio of 9.4 mortality uh, reported from the vaccines compared to that. Uh, again, we have that spike up there. And we're going to come back to this. The only reason being is because it does not look like it fully updated all the way. And so let's go to here. This is more of the up-to-date aspect regardless. And so what we're going to do here is this, we covered this last week as far as how to make these, as far as making the data frame itself. And so let's see what we have here. Nope, this is the COVID rebuild. This is our states. And what we're looking at here you see a lot of information being reported uh, in reference to the hospitals. And we'll, we'll adapt this with Plotly about hospitals being full and inpatient beds and everything else like that. So this is COVID total inpatient beds in each one of these states. You see a little bit of a jump up there, a little bit of jump up there on the East Coast. And so I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, sensationalism in the media, but this is like really over the top compared to the actual data that's out there. So we scroll down there. Mortality does seem to have gone up in some of the states, uh, but it's, you know, some states down, some states up, uh, regardless of, um, you know, inoculation rates. Let's go down here. Let's go to the main information. All right, there is our mortality. 
currently right now at 2.82 uh, per million. You remember, and they remember that South Africa only had one per million. So just give you an idea as far as context, which when we started this back in April, it was 3.04 per million, or per 100,000, apologize, 100,000. So actually, no, that's per 100,000. And South Africa was, what was it? South Africa was do, 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 one per 100,000. So look at the exact numbers there. So this give you a comparison. And then look at one week. So that's where we're exactly at right now. And not much of an improvement in survival, uh, which surprised me still to this day. All right, now here we go, new deaths per 100,000. Now we're comparing, obviously, lockdown in California and New York compared to reluctantly locking down or not locking down all Texas and Florida. So let's go to one week. Florida, far surpassing California and New York. And Texas looks like it is 1.49 compared to 1.7. So basically our... our our lockdown resistant or no vaccine mandate states or no mask mandate states, uh, you know, don't, they, they seem to be doing far superior to other places that have uh, stricter pandemic mitigation lockdown factors without, and you know, what I'm trying to say, is there any, there's no rational to justify locking down or restricting civil liberties if the, the coral, if the observational data is not supporting it at all or has it been recently and so i mean you could jump on the you know this roller coaster anytime you want and make your conclusion but still just the same hmm. all right now this is interesting because the mortality is really low in florida so here we have an omicron shadowing as in south africa so look at this all cases are going up even though case rate may be lower in california new york and the case rate is higher in Florida, at least at this point in time, if there's not a lag, the mortality is far less. All right, and then we go to, let's go to our various rebuild. Now, what this is what we're looking at is basically vaccine reactions. All right, died or day within one day of the shot. And so this will give you an idea. So we have 1,864 mortality being reported. And again, each one of these spots, if you're not familiar, is actually a person. And so as we stop by, you can see um, what happened. And I'm just randomly stopping on a few spots right off the bat so you can get an idea of what is um, on the outcome or what transpired within that day or two. And this is the average age. This is long range report. These are reactions 11 days or greater outward and you notice that the trend here as far as um 365 days i don't know why there seems to be a major grouping in that particular area there and look at mortality the closer probably the more accurate uh will get the information but you can read the long lines just the same again randomly stopping uh right off the bat and the number of days is the days between the shot and the individual succumbing for whatever reason and we reported to VARES. So you could see exactly what kind of happened. These are real reports. And so we go back at that. Scroll down. Uh, same type of thing, box plot. And so you go to histogram and what looking at here is the, obviously the grouping of the ages and these are mortality within 10 days or greater. I mean, or 10 days or less, please forgive me. Um, 10 days or less. And you can see each one a little different. So we'll be looking for in the future is signals that have a commonality uh, where the mortality is out of a certain date range and to see if there's anything that really is going to draw a safety signal. That make any sense? All right. Now let's go to the European database. Here we go. Scroll down. 
Those are the serious reports. Let's go up here because I want to pull the mortality reports. Um, yeah, it looks le legitimate. Well, last week was like 19,000. Now it's at 20,152 fatal designations being reported to the Eudora Vigilance. And again, just like the VARES, that's to be validated. But 20,152. All right, go to the rebuild. And da 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 scroll down. Those are the most serious reactions being reported. And I know it's getting a little dry this late at night, but as I move through real fast, the number of reports to your vigilance is 1,304,635 as of December 25th. And then I think that's the reports there. Let me see how fast this runs real fast. And I am going to pause this once it comes up. And I'm going to run it. And I'm back. What I was checking for is to see exactly if they actually updated the information, the CDC itself. But it's evident that the information was not updated as far as youth, either succumbing to uh, COVID or or the vaccine itself. So I just wanted to validate the information. I just didn't want to have you holding there for a second while I was waiting for all these kernels to actually run. So what do we cover today? And just to recap real fast, ba -ba -ba, the myocarditis information, actually to close out the window, I'll have that link for you. But in myocarditis itself, it turns out it was basically 101 individuals uh, under the age of 40 under the mRNA vaccine. Uh, that basically developed myocarditis out of a million compared to seven uh, individuals that tested SARS positive in reference to COVID uh, per million. So that was about a 14-fold difference in that particular vaccine itself. And of course, all of them were higher, but that one really stood out. All right, the LLPC, long-lived plasma cells, which it turns out that these vaccines have not been shown to produce. And without these long-lived plasma cells, what happens? It says only cells of internalized viral antigens can be produced after infection. So infection is not prevented by T cells, only long-lived plasma cells. Oh, you still get the memory B cells. But in order for that to continue to keep on going, let's get this a second here. What did they say? They said that generally, as I'm waiting for this thing to hang up here, that's, there it goes, now to the bottom. Great. All right, hang on one second. Let's get this straightened up to up. Oh, there it goes. It said as follows, it will result in us basically needing to be vaccinated. What was that? Every four months? Yeah, something like that. There it is. Yeah. It will require for those that are vulnerable to be administered a dose of vaccine every four months. So you better make sure your risk to benefit ratios are in place. Then South Africa, generally they're just going, ah, you know what? We're done. And that pops up there. Give it a second. Yep, just basically, boom. They're just saying that's it. They're done. And uh, as far as keeping track and at a current mortality rate of one per 100,000, and they could see the uncoupling between Omicron infection rates and hospitalizations. Then here we go to, as well as that. And basically this one particular one, I'm going to pause this real fast just because it's running slow until everything comes up. There it is. Hang on. And of course, in this one, for example, cancer vaccination breakthroughs and well, I should say cancer vaccination and breakthrough infections in patients with cancer. What do we show in reference to the article here is that in the very least, uh, comparable rates were observed in the unvaccinated group or no benefit to the vaccine whatsoever, what it looks like in this particular study. And that those that were fully vaccinated, what do we show? Uh, did not seem to get their money's worth out of the uh, inoculation. 13 to 10, 19 to 13, 65 to 50, and that's in percentages. Proceed forward. We look at Omicron is basically pretty close to mutating its way out of any of the pandemic measures in place. Remember, we still have things like what's its micron size? Does it uh, transmit on surfaces? 
because we're still fighting Delta, even though now it looks like we're more fighting Omicron. It could be a totally different game. But again, until we know that information, it's going to be tough to make the determination. Proceed next. All right, after that, ba ba ba. As my computer is beginning to slow down, key population mini outcomes for each U.S. state. I'll have the links for there there as well. And then the Omicron outbreak, we looked at this. So it was a 21 out of 33 uh, individuals, uh, triple, sorry, 21 out of 33 triple vaccinated healthcare workers uh, that attended this private gathering uh, end up getting symptomatic. I regret we don't have an unvaccinated comparison, but still, you get the point. Symptomatic, of all things, 100% symptomatic. And then. We'll be, looks like SARS CoV 2 is finding its way into the world of wildlife. And look at this, I'm not even changing the tab there. It's like taking forever. Oh, there it goes, finally. And that's where I am going to end it because, main reason being, is we are, looks like we're real close to this computer coming to a crash. But again, gratitude. Thank you. Apologize for being a little dry tonight, but I kind of rushed towards the end there. And nothing positive as far as helping keep people healthy during the pandemic. It's just basically saying, hey, you know, don't rely on the pop, you know, the pop of the dogma because the pop of the dogma is not being validated in um, uh, non-virtuous scientific climates. Again, Ralph Trujano signing off. Gratitude to all the research out there. Thank you. Gratitude to Our World and Data, the GIS aid. Even the vaccine adverse reporting system database from the CDC, because again, without the CDC compiling the data, uh, we would have nothing to basically speculate upon. Again, Ralph Church Channel signing off. Look forward to seeing you all. Have all links together. And once it renders in 4K, then I'll bookmark it all for you too. I'll catch you in a bit. All right. Bye.